This is the Bell Books and Stories podcast with me, Kay Hutchison. Welcome, you're listening to the Bell Media Podcast and I'm your host, Kay Hutchison. In this episode, I'm speaking to multiple award-winning Scottish composer John Lunn about his soundtrack work in TV and film, and in particular, his music for the globally successful Downton Abbey. And although he's best known for the beautiful theme tune used on both the film and the long-running and much-loved TV series, he has in fact been responsible for the soundtracks of many other important series, including Shetland, Grant Chester, Bleak House, The Last Kingdom, Little Dorrit and Belgravia, for which he created sound worlds that are both unique and memorable. A musician myself, I'm keen to find out how John came to follow a career as a composer and how he works when he creates music for the screen. And of course, what it's like working with Julian Fellows. John released his songbook, Music from the Motion Picture of Downton Abbey, earlier this year. Hi, John. I'm looking forward to having an insight into your work and maybe a sense of your wider outlook in life, too. It's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome. It's a pleasure. So many successful soundtracks, uh, long running series, many of them, lots of awards, including two primetime Emmys. In fact, too many to list them all here. Of <laughs> all your soundtracks, John, what's your favourite one? Um... I think it might have to be uh, Little Dorrit because I just think I thought you know just the script and the acting and the story just I kind of all kind of came together into one thing and I just really enjoyed you know doing that. It's a, it's a beautiful theme tune. I really enjoyed that. I watched it recently actually on oh really on iPl- iPlayer and it just it's just such a it, it's just such a beautiful fit. And for the characters as well, I thought it was really brilliant. Yeah, it was, and it, 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 everything about it was just so brilliant. You know, everything, the way it was edited and the camera work and, and everything. It was just one of those things where every aspect of it kind of came together. And yeah, I think it probably is my best work as well. And of course, um, your other work too, we haven't even mentioned that you're a performer, you're a conductor, and you've written operas a violin concerto, and you were part of the system's music band, Man Jumping. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite a career, and in a way, I'm I'm so interested. Do you want to say something about Man Jumping? Well, yeah, well, well funnily enough, I mean, after like, kind of lying dormant for 30 years, we've kind of, uh, well, not exactly got back together again, but we've got back in touch, and we've we've been remastering the albums that we did and we've released one of them and we're just about to release uh, the second and that's that's been a really interesting uh, exercise because we recorded it you know kind of before the use of computers in music it was everything was sort of played live and interestingly it doesn't sound dated at all no no i had to listen to a couple the other day what what ones are actually being released re-released john so the first album uh, was called jump cut and then the second album was called world service which um which isn't quite out yet but we've remastered it and and we're putting it out you know you can get it on vinyl now as well and then we've had some of these um young sort of remixers, you know, take some of the material from the original multi-tracks and kind of make new sort of dance records out of them. And they've been very successful. Oh, that sounds great. Well, it's a beautiful sound, actually. When you listen to it, it it's quite, um, uh, it really draws you in. It's quite quite an experience. Yeah, no, no, we were, we were really pleased with it. I mean, I don't think we realised how good we were at the time. It's only kind of going back. And of course, we were, we were seven men, all heterosexual, all composers, you know, with giant egos. We um, <laughs> we split up after about four years. We, you know, we, we needed some sort of diversity in there. But no, I mean, it was a it was a seminal time. I learned an awful lot, and I, I did enjoy working, you know, in a studio environment. And I kind of began to prefer doing that way of music rather than you know writing it on your own in a 
you know, in an ivory tower somewhere and then getting an orchestra per to perform it, I did real realise that actually I preferred, you know, this this way of, of assembling music by playing things on top of one another and, you know, and recording and overdubbing. And and so from that point, I, oh, and I, I, I set out to kind of build build my own studio. And you're, you're quite techy. You like the tech side of things, don't you? You're always gathering gadgets. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're not so much gadgets as, you know, I, I, I buy loads and loads of instruments as, as kind of inspiration. I mean, sometimes I can't play them or I can barely play them. But, uh, you know, for instance, I did the music for Hamish Macbeth, which is quite a famous comedy about 25 years ago. And I, and I, I taught myself to play the banjo for that. It just needed... I, at the time being, I was always going to get uh, a professional banjo player in to actually uh, to actually redo what I did so it would sound better. But actually, I got so into playing it that I ended up doing it myself. Oh, that's brilliant! I, I think probably too, you're you're. It's easier to write for if you really have your own experience of the instrument and what it can do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it is it is quite a career though, very varied. Um, and I'm interested in how it all started when you were young, growing up in Scotland. Obviously, I can relate to that. And Absolutely. I was also, you know, drawn to music in terms of a career, but in a different direction. But can you tell me what was your early experience of music, and and do you think it shaped your direction in life? Uh yeah, but well, yeah, no. I mean, it definitely did. I mean, my father had been an amateur sax player in a jazz band before I was born, but even um, as I was growing up, he still used to to play it, and um, he was also a massive jazz fan. So there was a lot of jazz in the house. And then by the time I was about twelve or thirteen, I was really obsessed with music, and I had a brief flirtation with you know progressive rock music like. Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. I was gradually getting more and more obsessed with it. And then I saw Paul Tertellier playing a Beethoven cello sonata on the television. I think it was about 13 by this time. And I it just clicked. I, I just thought, oh my God, that just sounds so fantastic. So I went along to school the next day and asked if I could learn to play the cello. And they didn't have any vacancies for the cello. But they did have for double bass. And I thought, uh, well, okay, I'll take up the double bass. And actually, that just worked out spectacularly well because I think 13 or 14 was quite was quite a good age to take up the double bass, mainly because of its size. Um, and also, I was the only one in the school who could really play, you know, was playing it. And I was the only one, not only that, I was also one of the few people in the county. So as soon, after about six months, and people discovered that, you know, I could play the whole bass. I was asked to do virtually everything. And, of course, to begin with, I could barely play it. But, you know, to avoid embarrassment, I had to, I had to really work at it. And, and I did. And, I, and, I, and then about a year later, I took up the piano, which is very late, really, for a musician. And, I'd, and I was completely obsessed with it. And, uh, and nobody had to tell me to practice I just used to come home from school you know and I was straight you know straight down to the piano uh and were the, you making things up then John or was it learning not really you know I mean we the, the school I went to Stirling High School and um it, it was a really good school and the music department was very was really pretty comprehensive but Music education in those days was was all about what people had written. You know, there was this, there was almost this sort of feeling that the the best music in the world had already been written, and we were there just to learn how, you know, to how to it. Re, to <laughs> play it, really, you know, and understand it. Um, it wasn't really till I went to Glasgow University that that concept dispelled. I mean, what what did happen is when, I, but. Gradually, when I was about 16, 17, and decided by that stage, I knew I wanted to go and do music. And up until about my final year at school, I'd always imagined that I'd go to one of the academies, either the Scottish Academy or one of the, you know, the Royal College and, or Royal Academy in London, you know, and do specialising, you know, probably double bass and, you know, have piano as a second instrument. But 
but I did realize I was becoming more and more interested in how music was put together. And my, my head music at Stirling Eye suggested, so, well, what, you know, why don't you go to university? You can get the best of both worlds. You can, you know, you could, you could learn, you could keep your instruments going and, you know, and actually learn, you know, properly about how, you know, how music is put together. And, and, and that's what happened. I, and I applied for Edinburgh and Glasgow and got into both of them. Um, I, I ended up going to Glasgow. Which is which is a great place to do music. It was a great. It was a great place. To, it was a, just such a good course. I mean, I, I I just learned you know so much there. There were so many different things, and and also there 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 was that the feeling that you know that modern music or composing was still you know an important part. Yeah. Um. Um. And so so that was that was a very very good move. Yeah. And what is there a composer or a musician who you think particularly influenced the direction that you took? I th- I can't really think of any one person to be honest. Sa- yeah, it sounds to me as if you were absorbing like a sponge, you're absorbing Absolutely. all these different uh, styles. And yeah. maybe that is what you have to do for what you what you ended up doing because you you have to be able to be quite um malleable in terms of styles and um to reflect the subject matter that you're trying to to write music for yeah i mean because quite often when people approach you to say Rick, can you write music for my film they they don't know what they want they don't know kind of, they don't know really know what's going to work for it and so so you have to be really really you know flexible i mean there's a couple of things i've done where it started out they wanted a kind of like a jazz score but actually in the end that just didn't it didn't work because it just didn't tell the story so we had to go off and try something you know completely different so you do have to be very very flexible so just talking about pitching or choosing projects obviously um everyone knows Downton Abbey and its theme tune such a beautiful um memorable it's evocative sound can you explain how that particular um engagement came about yeah, the company that was making it, Carnival, I'd been doing a lot of work for. And the guy who ran the company, a guy called Gareth Neem, had also been one of the executive directors at the BBC when I was doing Little Dorrit. Little and, Dorrit. Yeah, and Bleak House. And he'd moved on from the BBC and he was doing this, you know, show called Downton Abbey. And, and he phoned me up and asked me, you know, would I be interested? And... Um, you know, I said yes, and they, I think they'd already filmed the first episode, and we met up and we talked about it, and uh, and then they offered me the job. Um, and at the time, I remember thinking, well, if this is, you know, if it works out as well as Bleak House and Little Dora, I'll be, I'll be very, very happy. Um, and it, but of course, it would be turned out to be phenomenally successful. But to be brutally honest. Nobody had any idea. Um, I mean, I thought it was. I did think it was good at the time, and it, and it was the first episode was really very well directed. It was really very very clear. First episodes are always a bit of a problem, especially for a run, you know, a long running TV series, because there's quite a lot of characters to, to introduce. Um, plus, you've got to hook people in with some kind of storyline as well and it did that it did that spectacularly well although i have to say the first 10 minutes of the very first episode of downton abbey is basically all music so so listen what actually happened did you did you see some of the film and actually immediately sort of think oh I, i've got a feel for what this is like or is, is it a much slower process it's like it's a slower process and i mean i don't like to work away from looking at the picture so they will have got to a process where we call the locked, where the picture is locked, i.e. the pictures themselves aren't going to change. The episode is there. All that's going to change now is basically sound. So, and I, I work, you know, by looking at the, at the video over and over and over again and kind of improvising to it. And when you, you know when you're getting somewhere when it, it sort of starts to take on, the pictures start to take on a new meaning. Mm. that weren't really there before and then that's when you know when you're 
you know, on the right get track. on the right track. And and the theme tune um, really came from the the very very first episode in the very first five minutes was there was no title sequence actually in the first episode. So it starts off with a train. So, you know, I, you know, that was just kind of like the energy of the train. And then there was a lone guy looking out of the window, looking a bit forlorn. Life hadn't treated him that well. That was uh, Bates. And there was, it was this kind of single note, kind of lonely piano tune. Dun, 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 picked out. And then we cut to the telegraph poles. And the telegraph poles were actually carrying a message that the heir to Downton Abbey had been drowned on the Titanic. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, the audience don't know any of this at all, but the music is sort of imbuing these things with a significance that you probably might not notice if it hadn't been there. And then, and then finally, the harmony kind of opens out and we arrive at a, a, you know, a beautiful shot of, Downton Abbey, well, High Clear Castle itself, and and that was all that material just came from from that. And then later on in the episode, uh, we tried that that music out in a few other different places, um, and it just worked really well. And it just it began to become like the signature sound of Downton. So when we came to episode two, and there was a, a title sequence. They asked me to do a 30 second version of that, which I did. And then they put the title sequence pictures actually to the music, which is quite unusual. Usually it's the other way around. I get I get given the pictures and you say, well, what you know, what would you do to this? But but what's interesting about that is that um I think if I'd been given the pictures for the title sequence, which basically starts off with a dog's bottom. You know, and then somebody dusting a chandelier. You know, I'd probably have written complete, completely different music. Absolutely. Yeah. You know. Um, well, I'm glad. I'm glad it worked that way because I think that kind of haunting, haunting sort of feel for the music is quite emotional. Really, is actually so important. Uh, so, could we hear you playing some, John? That would be really nice if you could. I'll play the theme tune. That would be lovely. John, that's lovely. You playing your own Downton Abbey music on your piano at home. What an absolute treat. Thanks so much. So, John, now when you're when you're choosing projects, what, what would you say matters most? Is it the director, the writers, the cast, or or even the book that it's based on that, that actually helps you choose? I'd be fun enough, probably the main thing is, you know, what kind of music that's going to require. Because I, I I really don't like to get 
typecast. I mean, for instance, after I'd finished Downton, I wasn't quite sure what I was going going to do next. Um, this project called The Last Kingdom came up, and I immediately jumped at it because it was going to be so different from Downton, and also uh, it was going to you know, like use a lot of electronics, which which I really like, you know, using. Um, and I, 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 at the time, I had no idea who a who was going to direct it, and b who was even going to be in it. And I don't think I'd even read a script. I think I, I think I just read a synopsis of how it was going to pan out. And I badly needed a contrast actually, because Downton had been going, you know, for about six or seven years, and and it, in it, it took up about six months of every year. So another six months, I was doing, you know, other things. And I did things like The White Queen, which, was, again, was another um, uh, period drama, but it was about the the Tudors, you know, in the in the, in the the 15th century. Again, that was kind of slightly different, but it wasn't as different as, you know, The Last Kingdom. And, and actually, The Last Kingdom's been very interesting for a couple of reasons, because um, although uh, initially we decided to use all electronic instruments. There was something, when I was working on it, there was something sort of missing. I needed something, you know, of epic. Um, and I discovered this uh, Faroese singer on YouTube called um, Ivor. And um, she just had this most amazing voice. Um, and just so, she could do so different things. And, she, and also she can sound unbelievably aggressive as well and and it just i just thought oh that that's what i need for these battle scenes and I mean, so that's, I onto, t- that's quite a few series now isn't it yeah we just finished season four uh well just before the lockdown we were really lucky actually to get it finished and we've done and i've done a really interesting soundtrack album with Ivor where we went back to square one with the material that we'd used on the soundtrack and but actually made proper tracks you know, out of them. And I think that works really well. Do you think with the success of Downtown, thinking about all these other projects that we're doing, is there is there much more pressure on you to compose a hit each time a project comes along? Um, do you always sort of feel, oh, this has got to be another big success? Um, no, because I don't think the success of something is really dependent on the music. Um of a show it's really dependent on you know well how the whole thing and how the audience reacts to it um i mean of course it's important to get the music right for the show but i don't think you know i don't i don't think any producer in the right mind would go well that's you know the music's not going to be a massive hit so we need to do something else i you, we just wouldn't think like that. So um, in terms of um, the process when you're brought on board, you kind of said something about the fact that you're often given quite free reign, because I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people who are actually really into the, the kind of um, the visual style or maybe the, the book, adapting the book, they're really looking for you to, to take a leap. But are you sometimes brought into a production where someone has a very clear idea and you know that's been quite a, a tricky thing to navigate or do you I mean you're, you're so easy to work with I'm sure you're you're actually a very good collaborator but what's your thoughts on I mean that? one of the things you learn very very early on is not to get too caught up in you know and too possessive of what you do you know yourself you know it's a very it's a collaborative effort and you know you have to work with the director or the producer or where the problems usually lie, and funnily enough, as you get more successful, these kind of disappear. Is that when you when you get a, a program that's got a lot of different people, you know, all with different opinions, and sometimes a Brit- British American collaborations can be a bit like that, where you've got both executives in Britain and ones in America. And and they've all got a different opinion of what the music should be like, and, and what works for their markets as well. Yeah, I mean that can that that can have an aspect on it. But how do you deal with that then, John? How did you deal with that? I just you know I just I just knuckled down and and uh, you know and took took everybody's notes on board and and you know there's a fair bit of 
a politics going, you know, going on, um, as which you learn quite quickly. You know, you learn to immediately take on, you know, somebody's suggestion and pretend that you've taken it on board. <laughs> you know, and then and then and then and then play them exactly the same thing back again. And then... yeah, isn't isn't that that is interesting because I think this behind the scenes thing is is so important to actually making projects a success and when I've seen you in 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 other interviews you're actually quite a strong character John so you've got a soft voice but you're quite a you know you know your stuff and you won't you're not a pushover but I I think that negotiation that goes on um is very very important to get to get a good result for everyone and I, I think it comes across and you were sort of saying you knuckle down that to me is very much a a sort of Scottish thing, you know, sort of just get down to the work and yeah. keep your head down, go, don't get too distracted by the politics. Uh, but also, to be fair, I think if there's been very few times where I've gone, right, oh, that, that's really good, that is so working for it. There's been very few times where, where I've actually come across anybody who disagrees. Um, it's usually really obvious if something is working well and and sometimes the most problematic projects are actually ones that have got problems anyway mm-hmm. you know there's yes. been a problem other with the problems. script yeah other problems and you know and and they're hoping that the you know the music's kind of always the last thing that goes on so it's, it's almost sometimes the last chance to repair anything that's not really working and 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 sometimes you will get asked to you know maybe make something more try and make something more emotional than than is actually coming across on the screen and and that that kind of have its own uh, difficulties. Yes, that that's so interesting, John. But of course, as you get further on in your career, you know you you deal with fewer and fewer dud projects. Yes, so yes. Kind of, so it gets you you you're, you're going easier. upwards. Yes, I that's interesting. yeah. Um, one thing that I was, uh, I'm always thinking when I'm, because uh, when, when I, because I'm a musician, when I look at dramas, I'm always very, very aware of the music. But I, I've always wondered whether, you know, the opening titles and the music set the tone for what's to follow. Once you've solved that, is the excitement of composing that really key piece that's that's all on its own without anything else. Is it replaced by something that's more about the mechanics of the music and underscoring the acting and the action? Or is, is it a different kind of excitement that you get? Well, funnily enough, I mean, the, the, the example of Downton that I gave you was, was actually quite rare in that um, what I do normally is I normally work my way through an episode um, and get a feel for it. and then. By the end of the first episode, or maybe even the second episode, the title music will actually be screaming at me. It'll be saying, "It's got to be me. It's got to be me." Because, and I, and that's what I always say to you, you know, don't worry about the title music for the beginning because it'll come, you know, from working on the show itself. And for instance, I don't know if you know Shetland, but yeah, that's I love what happened. Shetland. But that's what happened with with Shetland. I mean, at the beginning. Um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say they weren't entirely sure quite what Shetland was going to be. It was it was a very dark story, but there was also comic elements to it. And the, there was a sort of title sequence in the pilot that was, you know, beautiful shots of Shetland and, and everything like that. And then for so for months, I resisted doing some kind of tour, Scottish tourist board, <laughs> yes. you know, thing. You know, it would have been fine, but it wouldn't really have told you kind of what the show was about and then towards the end of the second episode there was a um, sort of pagan ritual which goes on in Shetland called Up Helia which is where they burn a Viking boat and although it's a kind of semi it's a festival and you know and you know it's, uh, the, the, it's looks like good fun there was a sort of dark undertow to it and I wrote this piece of music for that very sequence and that was at the end of episode two and as soon as I'd written it I went oh that's it. That's, the That's it. You knew. That's you it. Knew. Went back to the beginning of episode one, did a version of it, and I and everybody went, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's it." So it's it. There, you know, the the title sequence is not. It's not a thing you think of it being removed from the show itself. It, it's it's a direct 
you know, it, it comes out of working on it. As a as a writer myself, I'm often told that I should be work, writing, you know, X thousand words each day to practice and refine my skills. Oh, and yeah. the, the reality is that I, I tend to do great big chunks of writing and then I take a rest. But is it the same with musical composition? Do you feel you have to compose yeah. every day or...? I mean, I, pro- I probably do, you know, work every single day. Um, you know, maybe a Saturday or Sunday, you know, might I might only do two or three hours or something, but I probably work every day. Um, but, you know, but to be honest, you know, there are days where I, I might have nothing to show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, indeed. But but at least you're you're in the flow. Can you, uh, I'd love to get a little glimpse um uh, for you know, just what what is your setup like at, at home? Where do you know describe the equipment you have around you? What what sort of atmosphere is the room, the studio? Well, finally, I, I was going to take a break just after the lockdown started, but I was actually going to spend quite a lot of money extending the studio because it's in the basement of our house in southeast London, and. My kids are now 23 and 25, but we've been here for about 17 years. Mm-hmm. But I'd, if, oh, very if I hadn't, settled in. <laughs> if I hadn't, you know, if I hadn't put the studio in the basement of the house, I'd never have seen the kids when they were growing up, you know, because it was, and, and that worked, it worked, did work really, really well. So there's, there's an awful, I've got an, a recording booth where I can, I could record like a few instruments. I've got quite a lot of guitars and, you know some some drums and uh, I've got a lyre which I used for the Last Kingdom and a and a Finnish instrument called a cantella which is a little bit like a dulcimer and then there's tons of analog synthesizers which I've got a bit obsessed with. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've also got a second studio um, up near Tower Bridge because one thing I did learn very early on was never to mix my own music because it's particularly for TV and film because you I end up making it too musical and and whereas I, I, I found somebody about twenty years ago who who is a brilliant mixer and he so he mixes everything. So he comes here to my studio when it's ready to be done. I've done as much as I possibly can. And so I just let him get on with it. And then I so I go up to the other studio and get on with another job. So um so that that's working out uh, really well now. And do you have to have like a big un, uninterrupted a uh, chunk of time to get into the flow of composing? Or, or, yeah. and, and do you work late or early? What's your kind of routine? I mean, as I've got, I, I said, when I first started out, I, I I did have this idea that I could you know try and do everything myself, which was a bit of insane, and ended up you know staying up all night occasionally mm. I, I can't do that anymore so I do you know I employ more and more people to help me I still basically write everything although I must confess my assistant Danny did do a lot of work on the last season of the of the last kingdom um but uh nowadays I uh, the best music is written between sort of eight and midday <laughs> Yes, the morning. I think, yeah, morning, yeah. And do you sometimes have, I mean, what, what do you do if you have challenges when writing to deadlines or, or maybe even just writing block? How, how do you deal with that? Starting a new project, com- a completely new project, is always that scariest. You know, it's it's like for you just having a blank page. You know, how do you, what do you, how do you even start? That's always the scariest and that, that's the one where I need quite a lot of concentration so I'll probably leave myself with like five solid days of you know maybe six or seven hours of just concentration and and just going over the video again and again and again and then trying it and see what's worked but then once you've got that then then I can start working much much quicker and when it comes to the second series of something then I you know there's always something there's always some new element of music that every episode requires but quite often you know 30 percent of it is is not a repeat but developing that material that you've that you've created for the first series 
and you know what the sound world for the second series is. So, I, I mean, to be honest, the Belgravia, which I did, which I finished at the end of last year, was really the first new thing I'd done for a couple of years. Because mm-hmm. the rest of the time I was doing um, either the Downton Abbey movie or uh, The Last Kingdom, and I did this other series called Jamestown, which went to to, to three series. So and in and Grantchester, which was all on like and Shetland, which were on it's, like it's series four or these, five. These things go go on like that. I mean, that it's, television's for... just gone berserk in yeah. Britain. I mean, you know, it's just and of course they sell everywhere. They sell all over the world. So they're massively successful. And can I ask, just getting back to the Downton Abbey songbook, just briefly, um, is that the first music that you've had? published as a physical book in your own right? Uh, no, I think uh, I think there was one. I did a, the very first album I did for Downton Abbey after series two or maybe even one. It, no, somebody did produce a piano book of all that. So I think it's, it's this. I think so. I think this might be the second one. So um, Hitchcock and Herman were a, a fantastic director musician team with vertigo and cycle now our fellows in lund heading in the same direction <laughs> well funnily enough i am doing the next one of the things i've meant this I'm, I'm supposed to be doing this hbo show that she's being filmed in new york which is of course has been um postponed it's, it's called the gilded age um and it's about the sort of rise of in new york in sort of 1870 1880 um, and it's a huge ten part series. Um and I'm so I'm doing the music for that. But yeah, Fellows Lun, I think you might need to give it a little bit of time to see if that'll <laughs> have the same resonance as uh, why it's why got do you think, John? I'm I'm obviously been saying, you know, why I think Downton's so great, but you know, there's so many enthusiastic fans. I look at all the fan clubs out there, the interest and the love of the music in the series. What, what, why do you think it was received and has been received and still being received so warmly? I think, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to say because, you know, if you could bottle that, you'd carry on doing it. I mean, it, it did, it, it seemed to have something for everybody. I mean, am I fooling myself? Did it, did, could, was it the sort of thing that both young and old could watch and get something out of? And also, I think, Possibly it, it's it's a little bit of a historical whitewash in, in terms, you know, um, I bet conditions for a, a lot of the people that you appear in Downton Abbey were, were much worse than are portrayed in Downton Abbey. But I think that, I think there is, there's definitely a concept that, that, that people's lives are treated equally, you know, with the same degree of importance. I, th- I think it has got that, and certainly musically as well. You know, to, to, you know, if a servant falls in love, it's it's as much as being in love as, you know, as Lady Mary. You know, I mean, I know that seems obvious, but I'm not sure. You know, there was a lot of. I'm not sure everything does that. No, and it's just a brilliant connection between uh, human beings, really, isn't it? Yeah. I, actually, one of the yeah. things I find quite interesting about it is that obviously it's, it's hugely skewed skewed to women but I think a lot of men are quite happy to sit down with um people who love it um and you know sort of quite happy to sit there with you know um the the person who's a real fan um so I I think it's got this kind of universal appeal I think that's it yeah yeah before my final question John I have a little secret to share oh yeah I've seen a video of you as a student playing guitar in a pop band called Earplay and uh, great oh music God. too <laughs> oh I God. wonder did you did you ever imagine becoming an Emmy award winner for a period drama about a stately home in those days no absolutely not I mean oh did you think you were going to be a pop star I mean that was probably the hope I mean I know I was obsessed with music and I, my life was definitely going to be you know, about music. But it wasn't really until I was in my early 30s. In fact, I didn't do my first film till I was 31 or 32, I think. But I'd had 10 years in London of doing virtually every sort of style yeah. of music. 
really the learning ground that was you gathering all your um, experiences and, and skills. I mean, I I'm slightly on the one hand, you know, I'm I'm really pleased that that I've made a real success of it. On the other hand, I I I spent my twenties almost being part of the an avant garde like classical and in, in pop music, and I've kind of lost that for one reason or another. You know, I've become more and more and more commercial, which has not really been by design. Um, you know, partly it was, you know, it was to earn money. You could, I could tell. You know, and I mean, I've, I've, I've completely earned a living for my my family out of writing music for film and TV. You know, not for writing operas or violin concertos. And so, so you know, you could say that that's sort of been imposed upon me. But in a way, you haven't lost it because I can hear from you talking about the man jumping and the fact that that's morphed into something that other uh, more diverse voices are contributing to and actually breathing new life into. It's still it's still there. But obviously, you've been pulled along in this great wave of yeah. um you know, of successful TV series and, and, and good for you, <laughs> is all I can see. Um, I just want to ask you my, my final question, because I think uh, as when you were young and you, you just you don't know where things are headed, we're in another period like that where we really have no idea what's going to happen in life. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I, I think in lockdown, things are quieter, less pressured, but there's this uh, tremendous feeling that there are very busy times ahead when drama productions, you know, for me, publishing gets going again. Yeah. Um, yes, we're in a golden age of TV scores with the likes of Netflix spending enormous amounts in production. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to what you as an, as an individual can, you know, envisage what's going to happen. I mean, what do you think, John, is is going to happen next for you or what what would you like the next thing to be for you oh i mean that's a that's a really tricky one i um i mean in terms of what direction music is going to to go in i i I think it's still there's still an upward trajectory of just of the importance of music in film and tv i mean if anything it's getting you know it's getting more and more important and I think people are sort of recognizing that how whether that in itself means that it affects the way that scripts are devised or storylines are even devised to kind of encompass music in some way would be an interesting development I haven't really seen signs of anything like that I think one noticeable thing that I that's happened to to me in terms of working in drama is that um, I've gone from writing lots of big tunes to begin with and where to nowadays you know a lot of the music I write is psychological it's about what's going on inside people's heads and that's that you know, and it's become even more and more of a storyline mm, yes there's a real shift isn't there yeah, because, you know, even on period dramas, you would get in the past, like 20, 25 years ago, you'd have these, you know, big carriage drives or something where, you know, you'd need music to take you from A to B. I mean, I think partly because of budget, you know, those are harder and harder to film, so you don't get those anymore. So there was, so the music, you know, has kind of taken on a slightly different purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really noticed that, and the first one that I, where I really did, Notice that was uh, Bleak House, where uh, although it was a period drama set in 1820, the music was actually a bit like Friday the 13th, because it was it was a true reflection of what was going on inside somebody's head. You know, it wasn't trying to be, it wasn't trying to put you in London in 1820. Um, and I think that's that's I mean that that still goes for me today. You know, the music for Downton doesn't come from 1912 England. You know, it's actually much more a combination of possibly even Coldplay and Philip Glass. Yes. 
Oh, it's so funny you mentioned that. I was just listening to Coldplay this morning and Philip Glass, and that comes out from the the man uh, jump, man jumping music as yeah, well. I can really right. see this. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that we we need music like that now because there's a lot of anxiety around. But I I, I think it's just to me it's such a a key for bringing people together and actually making yeah. making people feel better about yeah. things that are difficult challenging times yeah and also i i, I like the i really like the breakdown of genre that's going on at the moment i think it's, that's that's becoming you know really good i think because for a while there was this kind of sort of belief that classical music was like at the pinnacle of the achievement and then you know pop music was somewhere you know down below you know i think that's you know utter nonsense and you know talking politically if you look at the What's kind of slightly disgraceful about the Black Lives Matter progress is that really the last 120 years, music has been entirely about black music, you know, and even white composers like Stockhausen are almost, I think, a reaction to that. You know, without black music, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have pop music. And I think, I mean, it, it seems shameful in a way that we're only now kind of getting to that stage where, you know, it's actually actively acknowledged well john uh, that is all so interesting fascinating and and you did give me an insight in how you think about that life as well as um you know your your work in music i certainly am looking forward to hearing what you're going to do next and i think it will make me enjoy your music all the more knowing you a little bit better through this oh, uh, thanks, this Kim. podcast so um Thank you very much, John. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking to you and I'm very keen to include some information for anyone wanting to find out more about you and your work. Where should they look if they're looking? Um, I've got uh, I, quite a lot of my, my music on a SoundCloud account called, called John Lunn. Um, I've got a, a website, which is jlunn.com, although I've got very bad at updating that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and my my agent, um, Cool Music Limited, uh, they've got their website as well. There's a, there's a lot of information on there. That's great, and and there's obviously things on IMDb as well. So the, I yeah, I will absolutely. include some yeah. of those those uh, links with uh, the podcast when it's completed. So thank you again, John. And thank you, Kay. Re- really great to have you on. And also thank you to um, you for listening to the Bell Books and Stories podcast. Today's producer was Perrin Sledge and I'm Kay Hutchison. Hope you'll join me next time. In the meantime, bye for now. Bye.